received a letter recently from a young man who was very, very encouraging and supportive. He went on at great length to tell me uh, how much he appreciates the work that I do. And he said, let me tell you just how much I appreciate it. The other day, some people on Facebook were saying that you are nothing but fluff and irrelevance, but I slammed them and defended you. <laughs> Got your back, dude. First off, I don't know how you slam someone on Facebook. Um, maybe I virtually slammed them. Now, I put the letter down, and my most uh, sort of fundamental impulse was not gratitude for the fact that he has my back, dude. Two words were like burning at the front of my brain and heart fluff and irrelevance. His attempt was honest and kind and appreciative and full of gratitude and love. He just wanted to let me know he, he, he's on the team. This letter is what I call a chocolate-covered turd. At first glance, it appears attractive and maybe even pleasing to the palate. And then you take a bite of the chewy center. <laughs> the intent of the encounter was support, appreciation, and love. But the problem is, what I extracted from it and took away was a bit of a mixed blessing. Now, the fluff and irrelevance got under my skin and bothered me. But it wasn't just the fluff and irrelevance. What was more insidious was my frustration that the fluff and irrelevance comment was hard to just kind of slough off. So it worked at one level, and yet at the same time, it had a sort of sandpaper grain on the nerves, a kind of c compressing the heart. It worked on two levels, and I think actually it was the frustration that I couldn't just blow it off instantly that was actually more painful than the actual content of the accusation. And so, my experience has been that, that it is difficult to shake these sorts of things that come your way. They sometimes even come with the noblest of intentions, and yet you walk away limping. You're, and it's not just that you're carrying around like that hurt, but there is this, I'm bigger than that. I mean, that should bounce off. And so we have sometimes it's just an inflated sense of our own, you know, I'm a spiritual authority, I'm a leader, I'm the pastor of this church, I should be able to. Sometimes we have a, a sort of inflated ego in which we're, we're, we're so shocked that we are better than this. And yet it's right there. Or how many of you have had this? I, I would call this one uh, the nine and the one. Ten bits of feedback about something. And nine of them are not since Moses came down the mountain. <laughs> It's the, it's the Easter service, and something happens on Resurrection Sunday, and man, lift off, transcendence, oh, man, blew the roof off the joint, and one person, I brought my aunt, and she's allergic to the flowers, she stormed out, I spend the rest of it, and so you got the nine and the one, and yet you walk away, and what's the, what's the one you remember? It's the ratio killer. It's the, ah, oh, wow. There's 99 great things happened today. 
I heard 999 amazing stories about the kingdom that is advancing, the new creation bursting forth right in the midst, but then that one person sent that email, and that's the thing I can't shake. And it isn't just the content of it, it's I'm supposed to be able to shake this stuff. Or um, how about this, how many of you have heard a rumor about yourself? How many of you have ever heard a rumor about yourself that was true? <laughs> Correct, because then you wouldn't call it a rumor. You'd call it news. <laughs> I have heard things, such unbelievable things. Uh, there's a part of me sometimes that just wants to say, mm-hmm, it, it is true. I, I do have secret dreams of opening a shoe repair shop in Ohio, and in fact, I'm moving there next week to do that with the money I made from betting on ostrich racing. Yeah, that's, that's actually true. <laughs> and I've been able to cover it up this whole time. There is this strangely comforting moment for me when one of the, uh, I believe it's a Roman city official, says to Paul in Acts, aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because 4,000 revolting Egyptians in the desert can't be wrong. Uh, um, th there is this pain, and, and here's what happens. Your friends hear the rumor at the same time you do, and they laugh, and they say, okay, that is so crazy. You just gotta laugh about that. You just gotta blow that one off. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's not about you. It's about me. And there's a difference. Your friends are very helpful, and they're like, oh, come on, that stuff. That's just crazy. Yes, but it's out there, and it's about me. And it isn't just the content of the rumor. I'm what? I'm going where? I have... That's my secret agenda? It is? If I was gonna have a secret agenda, I'd hope it'd be better than that. <laughs> I mean, I hope it'd be like truly devious and, and clever and devious. You know, with not just that, anybody could come up with that. It's not just the content, it's that thing of, I know, I guess I am supposed to blow it off. And sometimes our friends can actually, in a strange sort of way, we can be in environments that, that caused the inner dialogue to rev even faster because, yeah, you're right, I guess I should be able to blow that off. So it's an hour later, you're driving home, it's that evening, it's the next morning, and for some strange reason, it's still kind of lingering there, and you don't actually want to share it sometimes, and actually what's the beautiful thing is when you can share it, but sometimes it's just the inner dialogue that plays. It's the, it's, the, it's the comment that somebody makes, ah, oh, yeah, see so you got a new car, pastor. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I did. Um, my donkey broke. <laughs> I mean, I have heard last, a week ago last Sunday, my goodness, are you eating? You look gaunt. You've really lost a lot of weight. Th thanks? <laughs> right, and it's not like this is a conversation, like, well, apparently now you are free to comment on my weight. <laughs> so you're in this awkward situation. I think we're having a conversation, but like, 
we aren't. <laughs> and my experience has been that when you are uh, in a community and you have some sort of leadership role, is you open yourself up to all of these things. And there are, there are really, really helpful sayings like most of the criticism you receive is less about you and more about the person who gave it. And at the same time, most of the praise that you receive is more about the person who gave it. And those are all very, very helpful. But my experience has been is that it's very easy to have an internal dialogue that is a bit split, divided, and wobbly at times. It's like a tape that plays, a voice, a conversation, and it's like, man, I'd really, I'd really love not to have that particular voice playing. Or uh, maybe you have one of these in your life, the Official Committee for Doctrinal Purity, Orthodox Rhetoric, and General Theological Correctness. <laughs> Self-appointed, of course. <laughs> it is uh, that individual or contingent, and however well-meaning, and however studied and learned and well-intentioned they are, they have this ability to speak and give their feedback at the exact moments when you don't need it. And it's not that they, well, sometimes they do have other things going on, but it's just, you know what, after what just happened there, what I'm needing right now is just a little space. Um, my energetic body, bit tapped out right now. And so I have learned in managing that energy that right now, I just need a few moments um, to let what was poured out be poured back in. And the timing is a bit off on having that discussion about that issue, about that nuanced word and how I could have said it that way. And so my experience has been that over the years, you get beaten down and it's sometimes from big, heavy, awful things that happen that you're a part of, relationships that fall apart, serious, uh, moments like a moment a few years ago when a whole group of people in our church set out to have my ordination revoked because I wasn't fit to preach the gospel. So it's like, wow, that's, that's something, I guess. Uh, because if I don't have that piece of paper, what would I do? And uh, <laughs> there is my experience. So there are the big things. And yet, there is a way in which the comments, and it's just good people, just sometimes it's people who just have a relationship with you because they've listened to you and you don't, and so they have their first maybe encounter with you one-on-one -on -one in the hallway, and it's, they're not at, at their most articulate or relaxed or at ease or whatever, and so things are said, and, and, and you have a sort of embracing ocean of love and compassion for them, and yet it, somehow that little thing got in there and it's, I call this over time, it's a sort of death by paper cuts. And my experience has been with leaders is it's easy to name exhaustion, burnout, pain from the big things. I went through that, well of course I feel a little bruised and beaten up and wounded by that. Well of course I'm limping because of that thing, I got kneecapped with a baseball bat in that situation. But, but what I would argue is even more painful and wounding are all of these little tiny things that we absorb over time, but we are so convinced for all sorts of reasons that this shouldn't affect me that we don't really know what to do with it because like, what am I gonna go, seriously go to a therapist for that comment? And the truth is they start to build up and they can you're really bleeding by now, but it's from a thousand of those little moments. And uh, what I have learned is that what this can do to you in almost like deep recesses of your bones is it begins to affect us, sometimes because it's over a period of years, and because all of, they, they can all at the time seem so 
trivial, absurd, and superficial, is it adds up in ways, but you can't really identify it or see it coming or even know when it's really exerting tremendous power over you. And so there's a couple things in my experience that can start to happen. We hold back. We, in the early days, we went for it. We had that idea and we were like, let's do it. Let's organize the whole Sunday service around it. Let's see, and if it fails, if it doesn't work, if people have a sort of, uh, I, I refer to them as Radiohead sermons. I know I'm supposed to get it, but I'm a, I don't. <sighs> um, it, it's, and, and what happens is we took a few shots because of it. We, we took a bit of, we took a bit of like, was well, that what we're gonna come to expect? Kind of this, what, what about the Bible? Or, or whatever, whatever, whatever. And so what happens is the next time we have one of those impulses, hey, let's do this. It's that feeling before whatever it is you were gonna do when you're like, hey, you know what? And the other people who are, who are with it, you're in it together, you have this sense like, hey, this thing could, this thing could really bomb. I know. It's that holy terror of, we got something here we gotta share, and the reason why I know the experience is what we're supposed to do is there's a chance it could really fail. You know that feeling, do you not? It's whatever I'm doing, I'm not just, well, I guess it's time to say something. Whatever this is, at least I'm fully alive, at least we're trying something, at least in some sort of humble sort of stumbling way, at least we're listening to what looks like the spirit. We're chasing the wind, man. And better at least to fail doing that or whatever that means because then you realize that's not failure. That's just, well, now we know what we won't do in the future. There's no failure. It's just another opportunity to learn and grow and evolve and change and transform. And so what happens over time is it's like, wait, if I, went, if I put myself out there like that and I received those things, the next time you get one of those, it's like you back off, you hold back, if they uh, trampled on those pearls, no way am I, am I handing this one over. And so the prophetic, man, the last time I talked about the suffering in our city, a bunch of people said, stop making me feel guilty. Well, I, that was never my intent. I was just saying that one of the things Jesus teaches us is to say, well, okay, then I guess that's, you back off on the prophetic. Back off on the creative. You are working on something and you realize with this particular content, in this particular situation, I need to tell that story of that thing that happened to me that time. You share it with a couple friends. I'm thinking about sharing this. I don't want it to be exploitive. I don't want to unnecessarily manipulate people's emotions, but there's this thing that happened to me and it's, pretty personal and you wrestle through it because once you share something personal, you can't get it back. I think that story is going to be a sort of door through which a bunch of people can come into this cathedral I'm trying to build. And you do that and you take a shot, you take a hit. Somebody says, well, and then the next time you have one of those, you think, no way, no way. Am I bringing that out after what happened last time? And maybe you don't even realize it. Maybe what happens over time is a sort of callous builds up where we aren't even able to go to some of those places because it's just like shut up, like nope, shut off. Other times, lists and labels. Those people are bad, dangerous, mean, nasty, too theologically smart for their own good. Um, and so those people are just just keep them there. And uh, a labeling system develops or a list of that group. Oh, so-and-so, I know what they said and I just realized that they are in a small group with those folks. So clearly they've infected them. So if we're gonna head this way, just, just. and so we develop these to protect ourselves so-and-so, uh, 
And, and sometimes what it is is it's not even rooted in reality, it's a perception we have because of something that happens and, you, and, and it may not even be true. We're talking about perceptions, sometimes it's our own inflated sense of ego, you're either for me or with me, or, but nevertheless what happens is very easy to develop lists and labels. And sometimes, and we're talking about in a minute when that's totally legit, and yet other times the real truth is somewhere back there we got a paper cut and we didn't call it that and now we're trying to protect ourselves. And then there's just flat out revenge. Sometimes there's passive revenge, which is, I don't feel like giving my best today. Why would I give you my best? I've been here for three years, five years, 20 years. It's just, it's for, those, for you it's just one more Sunday, but for me it's, about, no. And we just, sometimes I'm punishing them in a sort of passive way because they hurt me and so no way are they getting my best. No way am I gonna put the hours in on that particular sermon. That's what they do with my stuff. That's what they do. I expected I had assumptions about this and it wasn't met and now sometimes we're not even aware of it but what we're really doing is we're withdrawing, we're holding back and it is a passive form of revenge. Sometimes it's just active revenge. We do want to harm somebody, we do want to slander somebody, we do want to, oh yes, yeah, so-and-so, uh, and this one you can always use, oh so-and-so, mm-hmm, yes, I, I've, yes, I've, uh, it's all confidential but I've had some counseling appointments with them. <laughs> not that I'm saying anything. But, let me tell you so that I can, you can pray for them more effectively. Um, no, there, there, is, there is this thing that develops. Wow, these people have just sucked my energy dry. And now I'm supposed to just pretend like none of that happened? I'm supposed to get up and do my best? I don't know. So my experience has been it is very easy for these forces to be working on us. Sometimes at a sort of subterranean level of the soul, the guts, and it begins to deeply affect the way we interact. My central premise is that to stay in this game and not just to have something to say, but to actually have more and more and more to say to be more and more filled with wonder and awe about resurrection, about the wonder of the mystery of God, about church, about the kingdom. My experience has been that the one thing I wasn't told, but the one thing that we must become not just students but masters of is you have to learn to forgive and you sometimes have to learn to forgive the actual people in your actual church. Now it's dangerous to just forgive a mass of people because it's, it's, it's sort of faceless mass, hard to forgive a faceless mass, but nevertheless there is a degree to which you have to get really, really good at forgiving people for that comment, for that email, for that off-handed thing that was said in the parking lot at the end of the Sunday when you were exhausted and just wanted to get in your car and go home and lay down on the couch. And it was like, okay, that was the one time when I didn't need to know about that. How many of you know about that? And it was like the one thing that just put you, man, can I even go on? My, my, my central premise and the one thing that has changed everything for me is, as a leader, we don't just get to be students of forgiving, we have to get really, really good at forgiving. We have to learn how to do it. We have to learn how to name the wound. We have to learn how to call it what it is. Those people didn't understand what I said, and so now they are spreading their misunderstanding. Well, what is that? Why does that bother me? Because I want to control people's responses to what I say. I don't just want 
the ability to control the actual words that come out of my mouth and the work that I put into this, I also, once I've given it, I'd like more, God. I'd also like to control how people respond. And I don't get that. I said it, and people took it one way, and it was not intended to be taken that way. And some people were not ready, no matter how much work I hopefully did to present it, they were not ready for that. And that's just where they are, and this is just where I am, and that is just what happened, and I don't get more control than that. And there is a tension there, and I cannot resolve it, and I want to, and I can't, and so I keep butting up against it. And that is what needs to be named and called what it is. And so we call things what they are. That hurt, and central to this, is that trivial, odd, strange thing the person said about your new trousers, the very things you're like, I should just blow that off. Whatever, get to the heart, mind that thing and get down to what it really is. Their comment made me feel very vulnerable, studied, examined, and analyzed. And that is a feeling of great exposure. Anybody relate to that? I don't like being exposed. I don't like being studied. I don't like being analyzed. I don't like people trying to figure out the motivations. Don't like that. Okay, then that's what it is. Apparently, I don't like something. Ooh. And so forgiveness becomes letting them go. Now, when you talk about forgiving, what, if you're like me, comes up right away is, yeah, yeah, but, but you, you don't know some of the people in my church. Okay? Sheep have teeth. <laughs> and they use them. So, so let me say that when I talk about forgiveness, there's a couple things I'm not talking about. And I actually think this is where, where it's very easy to get into lots and lots of confusion and trouble. A couple things. Next, Proverbs 26, 11, one of my favorite verses in Scripture. As a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat their folly. By the way, there's this thing I've bumped into time and time where people say, what's your life verse? And I'm like, man, I swear I have like 3,000 of them. Let me pick. Um, if anybody ever does that, just be like, oh, yeah, Proverbs 26, 11, write it down later. And then they go back. They're like, what? Would you sign my Bible and put your life verse in it? You better believe I will. <laughs> Sorry, that's a pencil. Do you have a Sharpie? <laughs> I, I think this wisdom of Proverbs is very helpful. One of the things the scriptures continually respond to is um, some people are toxic and they're going to return to their vomit as does a dog again and again and again. And you don't have to be there when they do. You don't have to be there when they do. It is okay to have appropriate boundaries with people who are toxic, especially if you are a leader. Because what can happen is we have this, I guess Jesus is just kind of a giant, warm, soggy embrace that just whatever they want to whatever they want to bring my way, I guess the loving leadership thing to do is I guess I'm just supposed to give them the time and everything that they need. And what they do is they walk up to you, they plug in, and they are just extracting energy. And you cannot figure out what just happened, but you're a bit tired that day. Well, you ran into several people who just plugged in and took and took and took and took. 
And guess what? This happened three weeks ago, and it happened two months ago with the same person. You can be an ocean of compassion and love and grace, and at the very same time, have very strong boundaries about exactly how much you can interact and engage with certain people. Are you with me? It's okay. Notice things like this. Notice what Paul says at one point. Warn divisive people once and then warn them a second time. Paul is absolutely firm, first off, that some people are divisive. Like he just calls it what it is. And sometimes there's a sort of, no, 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 I'm supposed to love everybody and everybody is a minister and a disciple. Paul's like, okay, some people are divisive. It's, it's not their opinions and their uh, desire for theological correctness and their passion for the church. They're divisive. And there's a posture of the heart. And sometimes, my experience has been, sometimes the divisiveness, that's like almost the root, masquerades with language like prayer and unity and fellowship. It's, it's, it's like a Trojan horse. I I guess I'm supposed to be like all about all of this, but how come it feels like there's something else going on just below the surface? How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? You're like, wait, 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 what what is that? Because it says it's that, but I don't think that's what's going on here. You are not an ecclesiastical punching bag hired by the masses to just take the blows. You're better than that. You are a precious resource. And you are a gift to your community. And sometimes what happens is congregations take all of their collective unhealth and there's this person who it gets placed on. And that we pay you. What are we paying you to do? I mean, you get a paycheck to put up with our insanity and toxicity. Isn't that the agreement? It's like page two of your description. No. 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 Notice this. I love this. Luke 12, 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, Man, who, who, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Just, just quote this in the words of Jesus. Man, <laughs> can you just feel it? I'm so tired of people like you. Unbelievable. By the way, the whole idea behind a judge and an arbiter is you would never go to a rabbi with Jesus' particular calling and, and place in Jewish culture for one of these things. Like, that's not my job. You, you're, you're coming to me for like a legal dispute. But everybody knows that you don't come to someone like me for something like that. And then secondly, the dividing the inheritance issue, well, wait, 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 wait. What is going on? What kind of messed up family are you and your brother, the, the, the levels of unhealth in the family for them, the brothers, to have this issue and have not resolved it in this particular place, but have dragged it into this particular place, it's like, layer upon layer of familial dysfunction out of whack with the way the culture does things. And, and come on, here, it's, get, get, do something. And Jesus, the divine embodiment of patience, love, grace, healing, and forgiveness says, man, that ain't my job. (laughs) It is not that at that moment he has a schizophrenic moment of (laughs) non-Jesusness. I don't know if you have heard this enough, but you need to know that it is okay to guard that resource so that it can be used most effectively to point people to a resurrection. It is okay to guard that resource and to steward it well, and you should never apologize for that. And what can easily happen 
is a stunningly disproportionate amount of the hours in a leader's life can be spent taking care of the arbitration needs of toxic, divisive people who don't have any intent of following Jesus in the first place. And then the real work is crammed in to a few table scrap hours in which you're exhausted, spent, and feel like this isn't what I signed up for. It's okay. I love what Jesus says at one point. We like the first part. Love your neighbor as yourself. Sometimes I meet preachers, teachers, leaders, pastors, and you start hearing about their work week and the stuff that they're involved in, and it's just like, man, you gotta love yourself, because this isn't. I think you know it, you just need someone to give you permission to say, come on, come on, come on. There's got to be a better way. So when we talk about forgiveness, we are not talking about having no boundaries. We are not talking about ignoring toxic behavior and divisive actions. We are not talking about being honest about, listen, here at our church, we embrace you and we love you and we are thrilled that you're here and I'm honored that you would come to me with this, but the way I'm going to serve you is I'm going to say no and I'm gonna point you in a better direction to somebody who actually can walk with you on this one. Sometimes it is I appreciate your passion for the truth, but we have now had X number of email exchanges about this issue. I know where you stand. You know where I stand. And we will have no more emails about this particular issue. There are moments when it's okay to say, I understand that you have a vested interest in this and would love for us to have continuing relationship and coffee and talks and discussion about this. But this community has entrusted me with a couple of tasks. And because I've said yes to these tasks, and because I want to serve you to the very best of the ability God has given me, then there are some other things that I have to say no to. So I'm gonna have to frame it for you in terms of yes and no. Because I said yes, I have to say no. But underneath it all is an awareness that this thing has been painful and I need to forgive this person or else it's going to be in there somewhere. And forgiveness is being free from it. Jesus, next slide on the cross, says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. My experience has been that forgiveness has a cost and involves a pattern. I believe it is built into the fabric of the universe. It's how the cosmos operates. And the Christ pattern of forgiveness involves death into resurrection. It is a pattern, it is a practice, it is a discipline, a rhythm, a ritual. And this pattern of death into resurrection is painful and costly and hard like all deaths are. But because it is a Jesus pattern built into the cosmos, it leads to resurrection. And so what happens in order to forgive is I suffer the agony of that wound and I name it and I own it and I embrace it and I call it what it is and I say, I journal, I speak, I write it out. This hurts because they said that and the reason why I'm still playing that around is because fluff and irrelevance is really, really 
painful to hear about hours of your life's work. It hurts. And so I'm going to go into that, and it's going to hurt like a death would hurt. But if I can go all the way to the bottom of it, and I'm still alive, what that death is going to lead to is a resurrection in which I will be a different person. If I stay true to it, there's no way to experience a death without coming out the other side a new person. Tim Keller, in his absolutely stunning book, The Reason for God, says there is another option, however, you can forgive. Forgiveness means refusing to make them pay for what they did. However, to refrain from lashing out at someone when you want to do so with all your being is agony. It is a form of suffering. Let me read that again. Forgiveness means refusing to make them pay for what they did. And we've explored some of the passive, quiet ways in which we actually, if we're honest, are making them pay for what they did. However, to refrain from lashing out at someone when you want to do so with all your being is agony. It is a form of suffering. Next. You are absorbing the debt, taking the cost of it completely on yourself instead of taking it out on the other person or the church or the congregation. It hurts terribly. Many people would say it feels like a kind of death. Next. Yes, but it is a death that leads to resurrection instead of the lifelong living death of bitterness and cynicism. The Christ pattern is a death that leads to life. When you can work through that stuff and you can stand in front of these people having forgiven a thousand little slights, that, that's something. You are free in ways you were not free before they wounded you. Because now your love isn't just, hey, this is new. Hey, these people are perfect. These people aren't like other churches. Man, they're part of the new thing. Oh yeah, it's gonna be different. It is, these people are human, and humans do things, and Jesus invites us to a new humanity, and in the new humanity that's happening to me, I'm alive, and I hold nothing against them, and so I got some stuff to share. Please turn in your Bibles. There is a vitality, a life, a sort of I died, but man, I'm still here, so let's go. As far as I know, the tomb is empty. People pick that stuff up. I swear to you, they pick it up. They smell it. They feel it. It's in the air. They know what's going on. That's why people say to you sometimes, I don't know what it is, but man, it was humming today. They use all sorts of language. They know where you're at. They know when you're beaten down. And they know when something else is going on. They know this. Notice what Parker Palmer says. He has this amazing book on paradox. He says, the cross says... The pain stops here. The way of the cross is a way of absorbing pain, not passing it on. A way that transforms pain from destructive impulse into creative power. And allow me to read that again. The way of the cross is a way of absorbing pain, not passing it on. You all hurt me. I will now, in all sorts of very subliminal sorts of ways, pass it back. And so then people are feeling kind of and so it comes back, and it just loops. And what happens when you forgive is all of a sudden, stops. There's no more feedback loop. And when that stops, You know it, they know it, and things start to happen. 
The way of the cross is a way of absorbing pain, not passing it on, a way that transforms pain from destructive impulse into creative power. Next. When Jesus accepted the cross, his death opened up a channel for the redeeming power of love. This pattern unleashes unbelievable things in the world. And my central premise is that to preach, to teach, to sermonize, to speak, to lead, we don't just need to become students of it, you have to get really good at it. You have to practice it. And it's like a muscle that the more you use it, the stronger it gets. The Christ pattern of death into resurrection. I want to invite you, if you are taking notes, let's just go to a blank sheet of paper. Is there anybody that you need to forgive? Is there any encounter that you are carrying around with you? Is there any church that you used to work at that you need to set free? Is there any contingent, committee, house church, small group, perhaps you may need to write their name down? And perhaps right now you're like, no, it's too painful. Pay attention to that. Because underneath the surprise and the rhetoric and the arranging and the storyboarding and the exegesis is the love we have for the people that we are preaching to. And it's hard and it's difficult and it feels like a death, but it leads to life. actually more painful than the actual content of the accusation. And so my experience has been that, that it is difficult to shake these sorts of things that come your way. They sometimes even come with the noblest of intentions and yet you walk away limping. You're, and it's not just that you're carrying it around like that hurt, but there is this, I'm bigger than that. And that should bounce off. And so we have sometimes it's just an inflated sense of our own, you know, I'm a spiritual authority, I'm a leader, I'm the pastor of this church, I should be able to. Sometimes we have a, a sort of inflated ego in which we're, we're, we're so shocked that we aren't better than this. And yet it's right there. Or how many of you have had this? I would, I would call this one uh, the nine and the one. Ten bits of feedback about something. And nine of them are not since Moses came down the mountain. <laughs> it's, the, it's the Easter service. And something happens on Resurrection Sunday, and man, lift off. Transcendence. Oh, man. Blew the roof off the joint. And one person, I brought my aunt, and she's allergic to the flowers. She stormed out. I spend the rest of it. And so you got the nine and the one, and yet you walk away. And what's the, what's the one you remember? It's the ratio killer. This letter is what I call a chocolate-covered turd. At first glance, it appears attractive and maybe even pleasing to the palate. And then you take a bite of the chewy center. (laughs) 
the intent of the encounter was support, appreciation, and love. But the problem is, what I extracted from it and took away was a bit of a mixed blessing. Now, the fluff and irrelevance got under my skin and bothered me. But it wasn't just the fluff and irrelevance. What was more insidious was my frustration that the fluff and irrelevance comment was hard to just kind of slough off. So it worked at one level, and yet at the same time, it had a sort of sandpaper grating on the nerves, a kind of c compressing the heart. It worked on two levels, and I think actually it was the frustration that I couldn't just blow it off instantly that was. I received a letter recently from a young man who was very, very encouraging and supportive. He went on at great length to tell me uh, how much he appreciates the work that I do. And he said, let me tell you just how much I appreciate it. The other day, some people on Facebook were saying that you are nothing but fluff and irrelevance but I slammed them and defended you. <laughs> Got your back, dude. Uh, first off, I don't know how you slam someone on Facebook. Um, maybe I virtually slammed them. Now, I put the letter down, and my most uh, sort of fundamental impulse was not gratitude, for the fact that he has my back, dude. Two words were like burning at the front of my brain and heart. Fluff and irrelevance. His attempt was honest and kind and appreciative and full of gratitude and love. He just wanted to let me know he, he, he's on the team. It's the, ah, oh, why, why, there's, 99 great things happened today. I heard 999 amazing stories about the kingdom that is advancing, the new creation bursting forth right in the midst, but then that one person sent that email, and that's the thing I can't shake. And it isn't just the content of it, it's I'm supposed to be able to shake this stuff. Or um, how about this, how many of you have heard a rumor about yourself? How many of you have ever heard a rumor about yourself that was true? <laughs> Correct, because then you wouldn't call it a rumor. You'd call it news. <laughs> I have heard things, such unbelievable things. Uh, there's a part of me sometimes that just wants to say, mm-hmm, it, it is true. I, I do have secret dreams of opening a shoe repair shop in Ohio. And in fact, I'm moving there next week to do that with the money I made from betting on ostrich racing. Yeah, that's, that's actually true. <laughs> and I've been able to cover it up this whole time. There is this strangely comforting moment for me when one of the, uh, I believe it's a Roman city official, says to Paul in Acts, aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because 4,000 revolting Egyptians and Dares can't be wrong. Uh, um, th there is this pain, and, and here's what happens. Your friends 
hear the rumor at the same time you do, and they laugh, and they say, okay, that is so crazy. You just gotta laugh about that. You just gotta blow that one off. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's not about you. <laughs> it's about me, and there's a difference. Your friends are very helpful, and they're like, oh, come on, that stuff, that's just crazy. Yes, but it's out there, and it's about me. And it isn't just the content of the rumor. I'm what? I'm going where? I have, that's my secret agenda? It is? If I was gonna have a secret agenda, I'd hope it'd be better than that. I mean, I hope it'd be like truly devious and, and clever and devious. You know, with not just that, anybody could come up with that. It's not just the content, it's that thing of, I know, I guess I am supposed to blow it off. And sometimes our friends can act